evening from London. Welcome to Piers Morgan Uncensored. At no point in human history have we been more self-aware about mental health. And if stress is a pandemic, there's a multi-billion dollar market for the vaccines. You might start your day by swallowing a Prozac before unpacking your trauma with a therapist, popping a diazepam for your workplace anxiety and winding down with meditation or wellness app in a desperate hope of getting some sleep. If you've got it, there's a product for it. We've never been more medicated, more therapized, or more legitimized for confronting our feelings. And many would say quite right too. But every study is now telling us that we've also never apparently been more depressed or riddled with anxiety. Something is broken here. And the answer can't be that it's all in our minds. A new study published today said that Gen Z employees in Britain miss an average of one workday every single week due to mental health, costing the nation a rather stressful $138 billion uh, pounds a year. And to be clear from the outset, mental illness is a deadly serious thing. Like every serious illness, it needs serious treatment. I would never question people who are clinically depressed or genuinely suicidal. But I do think it's time to draw a line between mental illness and mental health. Matt Walsh, who's been on the show many times, has stirred an emotive debate about this in recent days when he tweeted that depression is one of the basic side effects of being conscious. He later said that labelling negative emotions and behaviours as diseases is exactly the problem, and precisely what the psychiatric field has done. Maybe he has a point. The global therapy industry is worth $150 billion and it's growing at a rate of knots. Young people in particular are relentlessly bombarded by content which gives them every reason to feel uncomfortable and anxious. And they're actively encouraged to then vaunt their suffering. Is that part of the problem? And Britain used to celebrate the so-called stiff upper lip. I guess that boils down to being resilient in the face of adversity. If times are tough, well, we were told to soldier on, keep pounding, find a way through. It's become more fashionable. And again, many people think this is the right way to go. To be perhaps more in touch with your trauma, to get help for it, to talk about it publicly. Criticism, though, has now become recategorized as shaming. Disagreement becomes very quickly described as hate. All confrontation is categorized as violence. Is that right? It should be no surprise that there's been a bit of a cultural fight back. Hugely influential characters like Andrew Tate, for good or bad, have encouraged their millions of followers to see depression as a man made concept, which ironically is unbefitting of men. What do you believe about depression? Do you believe depression is a real thing? I can't become clinically depressed. Why do you know? Because I don't believe in it. I can't be haunted by a ghost if I don't believe in ghosts. Well, that's saying I'm never going to die because I don't believe in it. It's ridiculous. Well, he's completely wrong, as I said there. And there is a middle ground, though. And I'm glad he called out the excesses on both sides of the argument, just as when I questioned Tate's creative interpretation of the tears he shed in jail. Did you shed tears in your cell? There were tears that ran down my face, but I did not cry. I mean, that's crying. I would disagree. Yeah, you were crying, Andrew Tate. Maybe you're a little bit depressed as you sat in your prison cell. Nothing wrong with that. Just confront your feelings. But somewhere in his bombast, Tate maybe has a point. Podcaster Zuby struck a call with me this week, having just returned to the UK from New York, when he posted, if you absolutely believe you will get jet lag, and that's inevitable, you will get jet lag. I don't get jet lag. But as someone who just flew back from New York and has jet lag, maybe I should think harder about not having jet lag. You might be right. We do talk ourselves into a lot of this stuff. And we maybe have lost sight of the idea that everyday stresses and strains are as much about our ability and will to manage them as they are about whatever is getting us down. Maybe we've forgotten how to keep calm and carry on. Maybe we should stop thinking that that's a bad thing to be frowned upon. There are a lot of people making a lot of money by telling us we're not OK. Well, joining me to discuss this is my pack, Talk TV contributor Esther Cracker, Associate Editor of the Daily Mirror, Kevin Maguire, political journalist Ava Santina, and we're joined from across the pond by the podcast host I mentioned earlier, Zuby. Uh, Zuby, let me start with you, because um, I liked your comment about jet lag. Uh, it hasn't worked for me, but I like the inspiration that you gave me to try and make it work, and I'm working on my I-don't-have-jet-lag skills. Um, on the wider point, it's a minefield, this whole area, of mental health. There's no doubt to me, uh, I've got three sons in their 20s and I know lots of their friendship groups. There are, are lots of young people suffering from genuine anxiety. I wouldn't categorise it as clinical depression. Um, it may be in some cases, but just general levels of anxiety that I don't think existed 
when I was that age. A lot of it may be uh, phone driven, you know, being subjected to endless, terrible imagery, which we never used to have to be exposed to when we were young. I'm not sure what it is, but when you look at this whole situation, what do you think? Yeah, Piers, I think it's one of those situations where multiple things are true at once and people often go to extremes when it's not necessary. It can absolutely be true that there are people who suffer genuine serious traumas which require things like therapy and that there are people who have real mental illnesses or severe mental health issues where medication temporarily or even on a perhaps longer term may help. And that can be true. It can also be true that many things are being overdiagnosed and that the human condition itself has been pathologized in various ways and that there are all sorts of influences out there which are not necessarily serving people's best interests because they do make money, billions of dollars and pounds off of certain medications. You said the therapy business itself is worth, I think you said, $150 billion mm. Mm. Um, per year. And so there are very misaligned incentives here. But I do think that one thing that happens with a lot of these conversations is people are very willing to talk about the symptoms. But as a society, we don't often go deep on what some of the causes are. We'll talk about mental health. We'll talk about depression and anxiety. But there won't be a lot of talk about the family situation and the households that people are growing up in, their friend uh, social networks, not, not online social networks, but their real social network. Are they part of a church? Are they part of strong communities? What are their beliefs? What are their, what's their physical health status? Mm. Physical and spiritual health are connected to mental health. So similar with many other issues, we talk about everything at the symptom level and try to find a pill or a potion or a therapy that is going to work for everybody. But I think in many cases, we're not really getting to what the root of the issue is. You touched on one other thing, which is the rise of use of smartphones and social mm. media. That's absolutely having an impact on people's mental well-being, being bombarded by all these images and opinions and just pure amount of information every day. This is something very new that our ancestors didn't have to deal with. So I'm not surprised that there are more, young, right. more and more young people every year who are reporting that they're having anxiety, depression, or whatever else it may be. Yeah. Ava, it is a minefield just to even talk about this. You know, I could almost feel us all... You know, you're, you're, you're treading on eggshells with this, not to say the wrong thing, not to be insensitive, but also to recognise this survey that's come out. It's pretty shocking that, you know, Gen Z kids are missing a day a week at work and the on cost of all that. What do you think is going on here? Well, I agree with the premise there of your guest, Zubi, because you need to be talking about, like, what are the causes of this? If you look at Gen Z at the moment, some of, most of Gen Z are spending up to 60% of their pay packet on rent. They're poor mm. and they're not having a nice time at home. And I think that really drives into anxiety and also, as you talked about, their phone dependency. But, yeah, I mean, look, there is a conversation we need to be having about self-diagnosis that is going on, I mean, I think, particularly I think on TikTok. I think the poor argument... I do understand we're not in the best of economic circumstances, but, you know, like I there said... There is I, less poverty now in this country exactly. than there's ever been. Exactly, and I grew that, up... I, I grew up in... relative. The you thing mean is, absolute yeah. poverty. But the thing is, yeah. I grew, I grew up in Ghana... The percentage population that we, we categorise as poor. But yeah, the but thing it's, is, but it's relative. I, I, I grew up in Ghana, and I, I, I've seen triple the amount of depressed people in this country yeah. than there, so I don't think necessarily material deprivation And I know lots of well-off people who are extremely depressed well, exactly. and very riddled with anxiety. Actually, I'm not sure that money... Or yeah. whether you're poor or rich, I don't sure that's really what the core here. I actually think the dopamine impact of of phones, bringing so much stuff into their heads yeah. all day in a way we never ever had to experience when we were young. When I was young, you just you didn't have any phones. There was no internet. Now, if there's a war somewhere, yeah. they're seeing you know kids' but, heads being blown off in real time all day long. But there was it has also to have a bad effect. But there was also suffering in silence. Like after the first mm. and second world war, yeah. people came back. They were absolutely traumatized, yeah, were. and it wasn't recognised, and their lives were blighted uh, as a result. Now, I love Zuby's positive view of overcoming jet lag, but it exists. Mental illness exists, but you have a scale where there will be people well, actually, clinically actually, depressed and you'll have other, just have other people who feel down for whatever reason. Yeah. They're in a completely different category. And if we're medicating them, I think that's a big mistake. Is there a danger that if you mistake. talk too much about these things, you well, encourage people, as with everything in life, yeah. if there's too much conversation, yeah. right, and it's pretty well been yes. wall-to-wall 24-7 now for a few years, I see no evidence necessarily that it's working in reducing the number of people 
saying yeah. they're feeling bad. That's right. I it's, mean, the, it's the reverse of not talking about it and denying it. Yes. And, and then people hurt. Uh, uh, you know, we've, in, we've, in real pain. The problem is you can, we've you can talk. It. You can talk yourself into it. There's no we've, we've question. We've medicalized. We've, done we've that. medicalized real life. That's the mm -hmm. problem. Someone who has lost a spouse, for instance, of course, will feel sad and mm -hmm. depressed. But to say that they have depression mm -hmm. and has to take a pill, that's a mm -hmm. problem because you're not treating it the way that it should be treated. Mm -hmm. Real life happens. Sad things happen, and we have to have a way to deal with it. Young people also lack purpose, right? If they're seeing all these you know, people getting rich and having Bugattis online, they're thinking, how am I supposed to have that? What is my purpose in the life? The fear These of missing things... out. The, exactly. Uh, the envy factor. I mean, bringing Zubi back in here, um, you know, I think all these things come into play. The difference, like I said, between when I was young and young people now is their ability to have all this staring at them all day long. You know, when I was young, the most exciting thing you had in front of you was a conquer fight, you know, and you'd be studying <laughs> conquers outside in fresh air. We didn't have any phones. There was no internet. There was nothing like that. Um, you, you weren't really aware of all the bad stuff going on unless you watched the one TV news bulletin. Now kids are not only aware of it, they're seeing it in real time. Yeah, there are a lot of different factors. I mean, social media and smartphones absolutely play some role in here. I'd say another thing that has massively changed over the decades as well is just the situations that people are growing up in their environment, how many different communities that they're plugged into and how strong are those communities? We, we know that there's an epidemic of loneliness that we talk about. We talk about the epidemic of uh, suicide, particularly male suicide. Mm -hmm. We're talking about all of this mental health things. And it's like all of the things that help to keep individuals and societies sane and stable from family to faith to community to um, you know, the, the sense of meaning and purpose that uh, someone else brought up earlier, all of these things have also been eroded over the past, let's say, 50 or 60 years. So when it comes to these situations, I mean, why are people so desperately seeking therapists? I think in many cases, sure, there might be people who really genuinely need a professional therapist, but I think there are also people who just need someone to talk to and they don't yeah. really feel like they have friends or they have parents or family members that they can confide in and talk about these day-to-day -day issues and then it builds up and it gets to a stage where they feel like the only thing that they can do is go to a therapist or take medication or mm -hmm. perhaps even do something that's far more drastic. I mean, in the United States, for example, I read recently that 80% of the world's painkillers are sold in the United mm -hmm. States. 80%. Yeah. I mean, we think we're over-medicated here. My God, I mean, in, in, in the US, it's, it's really out of control. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, the USA has, I believe, 4% of the world's population. And then, as you said, they're taking 80% plus of the pain medication and things like o opioids. And the these things are causing massive crises in the USA. Every year, over 100,000 people in the USA, American citizens, are dying of drug overdoses. That's 100,000 deaths. So imagine how many other people are abusing those substances. Mm. And these are genuinely scary numbers. 100,000 people dying per year of something that is completely avoidable. Um, I think that should be much bigger news. But I, as I said, I, I don't know every single solution, um, but I think for the diagnosis, we have to go down the tree a little bit and not just hack at the branches and the twigs, but we need to get to the root of the problem. And it's not going to be one single thing. It's going to be uh, multiple things. And I think several of them have been mentioned.